afternoon and welcome to our DML brown bag talk today. <coughs> We're so happy you could all join us. Um, we have about two of these a year and I'm so happy uh, to welcome Jonathan Senshin, who is the assistant professor of book history and print culture at the University of Wisconsin in Madison and is also the 2017-2018 Pine Tree Foundation Distinguished Visiting Professor of the Future of the Book and the Digital Age at CUNY Graduate Center. Uh, Jonathan received his PhD in English Literature and Language from Cornell University and is currently working and finishing a book uh, titled Intimate Paper and Materiality of Early American Literature. Um, so I'd like you all to welcome Jonathan and um, we're so glad to have you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. <clears throat> um, thank you for the invitation and to uh, Jesse and Laura for setting it all up. It's been incredibly easy to, to come and, and, uh, and, and do this talk. It's also an honor to be here. I've um, been a, a reader of West 86 uh, since I was in graduate school. I'm also at UW uh, part of a faculty working group in the material culture program. And so it's, um, it's great to have the example of this program you know, as we think about what interdisciplinary uh, material culture studies is. Um, and I'd also like to thank um, Sylvia Tannenbaum of the Pine Tree Foundation who made it possible for me uh, to be here this year in New York. And thank you all for coming uh, to this wonderful lunch talk in this really quite beautiful room. So the talk today is uh, Type, Paper, Glass, and Screws, uh, Reading Surfaces and the Materialities of Communication. And it grows out of my attempt to articulate the link between um, my first book, which um, Jesse just read the title of, um, and the second book project that I'm now sort of getting underway here in New York. Uh, and both of these projects, I think, are related to my attempt that, to name the habits of reading and questioning uh, that I've been pursuing across texts and across periods. Uh, the, the book that I'm finishing now is about rag paper in 18th and 19th century American culture and literature and how rag paper functioned as both a material and a discursive site or a literary site where intimacy, proximity, and presence uh, could be mediated. Because rag paper was made from cloth uh, that touched bodies, covered beds, sopped blood, or caught wind in a sail, and because participation in the collection of rags was an everyday occupation occurring in the house in the street, readers encountered books, periodicals, broadsides, blank books, and all manner of paper as an archive of, uh, I'm sorry, the, the pop-up that I was told about just, just came. So that should be taken care of. Um, so I'll just rewind. Uh, because paper was made from cloth that recently touched bodies, covered beds, uh, sopped blood, or caught wind in a sail, and because participation in the collection of rags was an everyday occupation occurring in the home or the street, readers encountered books, periodicals, broadsides, blank books, all manner of paper as an archive of rags and also an archive of past experiences and um, labors. The prime example of this is an um, advertisement for a paper mill uh, that was originally public. It, it, it was originally um, a verse in the Spectator, but then quickly became used for advertising purposes for paper mills. And it goes something like, fair ladies, when the handkerchief is no longer fit to cover your snowy breast, send, send it to Parsons Paper Mill, and it will return to you in the form of a lover's note. Um, so in this book, I work with um, examples like this of both sort of advertising, anonymously written advertising poetry, uh, all the way through work by Herman Melville and other sort of canonical authors to think about these sort of intimate material circuits between the body uh, and uh, writing and the ways in which cloth that moves from the body uh, might dictate the way that things circulate in the print public sphere and also dictate what is written on paper. Um, the assumption normally is that paper is a sort of passive substrate or support for writing, but in, the, in this sort of 18th and 19th century imaginary, uh, that raggy content of paper could actually, they imagine, dictate what would be written on it and how it would circulate through the print public sphere. So my questions in this project have been about how one reads these material traces, about what it means to have, ra uh, what it means to have the rags of early American households, 
worked and collected by white women domestics or enslaved women of African descent, touching our hands now in the present as our eyes scan the text or image that has been imprinted upon it. Um, in the book I'm doing spade work uh, for now is about enslaved printers and other enslaved people in the book trades in the colonial Americas in antebellum US. The first person I've written about is named Primus Fowl, an enslaved uh, compositor and pressman in 18th century New Hampshire. And it's led me to ask similar questions about the methods for reading non-alphabetic or non-semantic elements of texts in order to understand more fully what is present there and who is present there. The short version, uh, because Primus Fowl and others like him could not read or write, he does not occupy one of the privileged positions that we, at least in literary studies, would usually concern ourselves with. He's not a writer, he's not an editor, he's uh, not even a printer in the strict sense because he doesn't own the press. But without his craft and labor, we would not have 40 years of early New Hampshire print. And the same can be said for print uh, from all over the colonial Americas and slave states and territories of the US. I'm gonna return to Primus Fowl for the bulk of the talk um, in a moment. So I've come to think of both of these projects as concerned with legibility. Who and what are legible within material texts? And how would literary history possibly be different if we were capable of accounting for the hand, mind, and arm of someone like Primus Fowl, or the women whose clothes mending, wound dressing, and diapering preceded their collection of rags for paper mills? How could there even be, the American poets Anne Bradstreet and Lydia Sigourney asked, almost 200 years apart from one another, a masculine public sphere of print without a feminine private sphere of domestic work with rags. Um, I'll just move forward to thinking about rags for a second. So here's Anne Bradstreet in, 16, uh, in the 1670s. Thou ill-formed offspring of my feeble brain, who after birth didst by my side remain, till snatched from thence by friends less wise than true, who thee abroad exposed to public view, made thee in rags, halting to the press to trudge, where errors were not lessened, all may judge. At thy return, my blushing was not small, my rambling brat in print should mother call. This is a sort of canonical early American poem. If you've ever taken a survey of early American literature course or read anything by Bradstreet, it's likely you've read this poem or heard this poem recited to you, uh, the author to her book, uh, in which it takes up a sort of classic trope of um, early modern women's writing, the mother of the book and the mother of the child or the book as child. But this one engages explicitly with the materiality of that book and its connection to the clothing um, and laboring over and around that child. Bradstreet's call to be attentive to the raggy basis of print uh, seems like a decidedly 17th century problem. But as I think about the connections between bibliography, book history, and um, even the digital humanities, I see the political and ethical urgencies of being able to read for the people, labors, and materials that live in our reading surfaces. I hope that our fields will call us and our students to be more attentive to and critical of the material roots of intellectual, cultural, and aesthetic production and to recalibrate what we recognize as legible in the materiality of the texts we read and produce. Since I've used this term surface, um, I'd like to swerve momentarily into a question um, in literary studies right now about called surface reading and its relationship to debates about critique and historicism. Uh, in a 2009 special issue of Representations uh, on the Way We Read Now, is the title of the special edition, uh, the special issue, Stephen Best and Sharon Marcus issued a provocative call for what they uh, named surface reading. Surface reading, as they describe it, is one form of the last decade's rejection of ideology critique or symptomatic reading as a literary critical method. Uh, Best and Marcus argue that the ascendancy of Marxism and psychoanalysis in the 1970s and 80s trained a generation of literary and cultural critics to look beyond or through the text surface favoring instead to plumb its depths, its unconscious or political unconscious. In this history that they provide, Frederick Jameson is the quintessential depth reader, and they quote him, this is Jameson, if everything were transparent, then no ideology would be possible and no domination either, end quote. 
Therefore, Jameson argued that the work of interpretation was to find a latent meaning uh, behind a manifest one in a text uh, and to uncover political and psychic truths that, quote, Jameson, remain unrealized on the surface of the text. Instead of reading beyond the text and interpreting or recovering what lies beneath, Best and Marcus uh, propose that we focus our readerly attention on the surface to what they say is, this is quoting them, actually there. Surface reading then is a kind of close reading, but one whose aim is ultimately poetics rather than interpretation. It's also been called like the return to description um, rather than interpretation or a new formalism in other, in other, um, on the other costumes. We will read the text surface and describe how it is put together. Uh, what are its component parts and how do they work together to make effects that make meaning? Though an incredulous interlocutor might ask which meanings get their effects described and whose writing counts. Surface reading is a return to the uh, poetics that Jonathan Culler described in his 1975 Structuralist Poetics, a project in which he sought to quote, this is Culler, lay the foundations for a systematic study of literature, a poetics and understanding of the devices, conventions, and strategies of literature of the means by which literary works create their effects. Um, I just want to mark the use of color's word devices because I'm going to come back to it uh, momentarily. So I'm fascinated and a bit troubled in particular uh, by Best and Marcus's use of surface to refer to what is evident, perceptible, apprehensible in texts. This is quoting them. What in the geometrical sense has length and breadth but no thickness and therefore covers no depth. This fascination owes to my critical stance towards the text as a book historian whose research focuses on paper and representations of it. Uh, paper is also a surface for the text, like to be kind of really ham-fisted about it. It even appears in the negative description uh, of Best and Marcus's surface, long and wide, but supposedly not deep. They write that, quote, rarely do they mean the literal surface of texts, paper, or binding, or typography. But from my disciplinary perspective as a book historian, and from yours as folks who are um, primarily interested in material culture, uh, we might ask, well, why not? Why rely on the metaphorics of a sheet of paper as a textual surface, long and wide but not deep, only to back away from its materiality? Surface reading purports to attend to surface without depth, a poetics of the manifestly there, rather than a hermeneutics of what is obscured, uh, but is what is there uncontestable? Surfaces have depth, right? And so this, is, this slide here um, shows rag paper, cotton rag paper at 100 times and at 1,000 times. So if we look inside what uh, actually binds our, pa our paper together, we find uh, these assemblages of raggy, shredded raggy remnants of, 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 in this case, cotton, other times cotton, hemp, uh, linen quite frequently, and a, a mix of all of these things, and other, other inclusions, uh, everything from uh, animal material to uh, things that, mineral content, etc. So here's a microscopic view of rag paper. We can see fibers of cotton shredded into a pulp and reassembled in a form, brought back into proximity long enough to cling together, making a dry, seemingly smooth and blank surface. There's a certain sleight of hand or eye here that Jane Bennett's vibrant matter is useful for helping us to get beyond, where an anthropocentric viewer sees um, nothing, blankness, smoothness, two-dimensionality, there is actually a complex relationship of matter, presences and voids, constant negotiations of tensions and forces, mostly beyond the unassisted vision of humans. But as 19th century authors like Herman Melville knew well when he wrote The Paradise of Bachelors and the Tartarus of Maids, an 1855 short story about industrial papermaking in New England, the raggy negotiations of fibers within paper do not happen without a massive coordination of human labor. 
In that story, Melville turns to the generic conventions of the sentimental and the sensational in order to make visible the humanity of immigrant women laborers that become subsumed invisibly within the supposed two-dimensionality of paper. Setting a scene in which the shredding and sorting of rags fill the air in the Berkshire County paper mill with particulate matter, Melville describes how immigrant women become, quote, sheety white with, pal uh, with pallid faced illness uh, from inhabiting these, inhaling these fibers in the air. This is the rag room, coughed the boy. We're hearing this from the narrator. You will find it rather stifling here, coughed I in answer, but the girls don't cough. Oh, they're used to it. What makes these girls so sheet white, my lad? Why, with a roguish twinkle, pure, ignorant drollery, not knowing heartlessness, I suppose the handling of such white bits of sheets all the time makes them so sheety. Melville's Tartarus of Maids, um, a hellscape of mid-century industrial paper mill, is meant to bring visible depth to the surface of paper, to use literature, representation, as leverage against all that contributes to the making invisible of technical and information labor, restoring depth to surface, making visible the human within the technological. This is really one of my favorite examples of the unhiding of information labor. It's a um, 17th century, uh, it, it's, a, it, it's a leaf from a 17th century text. Uh, I don't know when the paper itself dates to, probably also 17th century. But here we see uh, a handprint left by either a vatman or a kutcher uh, in the likely Italian um, paper mill. And uh, we learn uh, from this that there are m sort of many things imprinted uh, on, on and in paper. In the introduction to Between Craft and Science, Technical Work in U.S. Settings, uh, Stephen Barley and Julian Orr describe how technical workers mediate between technology and society in a structural sense. Because they link us to technologies that are nearly transparent when they work and troublesomely opaque when they do not. Print, in the form of newspapers, broadsides, and books, is one of these usually uh, transparent forms. Papermakers and printers are among the many workers who facilitate circulation of information in early American print networks uh, and continue to do so today. So I'm also interested in the way that this sort of prefigures, in a way, the art of Google Books, uh, which is a project of documenting the hands of laborers in the Google Book scanning operation. And there's a, uh, there's a URL to that project there, the Art of Google Books, it's a Tumblr. Information workers, quote, this is Orr and uh, Barley, information workers negotiate a boundary between the virtual and the physical, working to create a material text that, unlike a troublesome computer or poorly made book or a hand caught uh, in a, in a moment in the process of digitization, makes itself appear secondary to the information it conveys. In many ways, book history and print culture studies as fields uh, directly attend to the various forms of work that make up the unseen labors behind individual acts of what Robert Darton famously called the communication circuit. The historian of information, Greg Downey, calls work like this the hidden labor of information networks. And we can understand book history's foundational uh, foundational methodology as unhiding information labor within these networks and circuits. I see this work as a different kind of surface reading or a reading of surfaces. It has the potential to bring information labor and laborers to the surface out of the depths, the depths which are not simply the rabbit warrens of ideological hermeneutic suspicion, but rather are integral parts of the devices that we use to communicate, material surfaces that we habitually need to recede behind the content we wish to read and write, even as these devices transmit our words and signs. The kind of surface reading long practiced in book history, bibliography, uh, library and archival work, and digital forensics, and also material culture studies, knows that surfaces are deep and this tradition makes me skeptical of formalist methodologies that have no account for technologies of writing and transmission that are also quite literally dependent upon 
devices. And I'll just go back to color in the Structuralist Poetics, <clears throat> where he describes poetics as a project of understanding the devices, conventions and strategies of literature, of the means by which literary workers create their effects. <clears throat> and I've included <clears throat> just a photo of a, <clears throat> of a uh, 21st century cell phone with a glass screen to underline uh, the ways in which these reading surfaces appear invisible um, until the moment in which they become uh, frustratingly uh, visible to us uh, when they don't work right, when they unhide all the processes behind them. And also just to point out that Microsoft has a product literally called the Surface, uh, their tablet, which is just useful to think about, again, in a kind of like forcing the issue way, what do we mean when we talk about devices? Devices that make literature possible, that make meaning possible. So I want to pivot from this discussion of surfaces to readings of writing and print traces left by two information workers. The first, Shu Li Zhur, and the second, Primus Fowl. Having established that book history and certain kinds of digital humanities, like digital forensics and digital bibliography, uh, offer us different ways of approaching the idea of the surface and the materiality of the surface, I now move into a discussion of what this could mean for literary and cultural criticism in book history and I think also a kind of critical digital humanities. My first example from Shu Li Zhur involves a common aesthetic object, poetry, while well, my second example pushes the boundaries of reading surfaces by introducing ways that we might read the non-alphabetic, making legible the most material aspects of text production in the people who do it. Um, and I think Shu Li Zhur's poetry is a way in to this 18th century example from Primus Fowl that I'm, gonna, that I'm working up to. The final destination is a call for people who work with material texts, whether medieval manuscripts or bulk metadata, to adopt a framework for thinking about the appearance, circulation, consumption, and movement of material texts that make paper, that makes paper, glass, pieces of lead and type, and metal screws, and all the people who touch them legible. Um, I'm gonna talk next about uh, a man named Shu Li Zhe, who uh, was a worker in a Foxconn uh, factory in Shenzhen, China. Just a content warning, I discuss uh, his eventual suicide. Um, so just letting you know that's coming. Xu Li Zhe, a young Chinese man originally uh, from rural Guangdong province, worked at the massive Foxconn factory in Shenzhen, one of the world's largest manufacturers of digital devices and a subcontractor for familiar brands like Apple and Samsung. 500,000 people uh, worked at the Foxconn factory in Shenzhen in 2011. That year, the company employed 1.3 million people in total. Foxconn City, as the factory's physical plant is known, is 1.16 square miles. If you own an iPhone, chances are near 100% that it was produced at Foxconn. The economies of scale and speed Foxconn claims to have achieved are what makes it supposedly impossible for Apple to produce devices in the United States. Working conditions have been described as brutal. Between 2007 and 2013, there were 23 worker suicides at Foxconn, many involving people um, leaping to their deaths from the roof of on-site dormitories, including Xu Li Zhe, who took his life by jumping from a Foxconn dormitory on the 24th of April, 2013, at the age of 24. Li Zhe, like many young people from rural areas, hoped to make money at Foxconn and move into other kinds of work, mostly with books, uh, his friends say that he loved the Central Book City in Shenzhen, possibly the largest bookstore in the world, which offers three million books for sale. He tried to get a job there, but was not hired. After his death, a friend recalled that Li Zhe's dream was to become a librarian. Back at Foxconn, Li Zhe tried to move from the production line to a job at the company's employee library. Again, he was not hired. The same friend said that though Leisure was miserable at Foxconn, he did not want to return to his rural hometown because online booksellers would not deliver to him there. Leisure wrote poetry about his life and work, uh, poetry that went viral online last, uh, last year after it was translated into English and news of his suicide spread along with it. 
I want to focus on something that Leisure's poetry shares in common with Melville's Tartarus of Maids, the way it invites a reading of the human agency within the depths of material reading services, these ones digital. Here is uh, I Fall Asleep Just Standing There, Just Standing Like That. Um, I cannot read uh, in um, Chinese characters, so I'm relying on translations posted to Chinese social networks and then shared on English language blogs and news sources. The link on the PowerPoint goes to a slide that includes uh, the original poem as written by Xu Leisure. I fall asleep just standing like that. The paper before my eyes f fades yellow. With a steel pen, I chisel on it uneven black, full of working words, workshop, assembly line, machine, work card, overtime, wages. They've trained me, not to be they've trained me to become docile. Don't know how to shout or rebel, how to complain or denounce, only how to silently suffer exhaustion. When I first set foot in this place, I hoped only for that gray pay slip on the 10th each month to grant me some belated solace. For this, I had to grind away my corners, grind away my words, refuse to skip work, refuse sick leave, refuse leave for private reasons, refuse to be late, refuse to leave early. By the assembly line, I stood straight like iron, hands like flight. How many days, how many nights did I, just like that, standing, fall asleep? Here, we see Leisure moving from paper and writing immediately to the digital device assembly line. Writing with ink becomes chiseling, and then we move to what he calls the working words that dominate his attention, workshop, assembly line, machine, work, work card, overtime, wages. The writing surface and the eye of the information worker does not recede, rather it encrusts with yellow and offers the kind of material refusal, yellowing into stone so difficult that writing becomes chiseling, that his own laboring body cannot enjoy as he uh, is compelled to be on time, to stay late, to say yes to the work until his laboring body and his consciousness separate, leaving him asleep, standing just like that. In the second of his poems that I want to read today, it is a metal screw, not paper, that emerges as the part of the material text to which the information laborer and poet wants a, to draw, a, to which the leisure wants to draw our attention. A screw fell to the ground a screw fell to the ground in this dark night of overtime, plunging vertically, lightly clinking. It won't attract anyone's attention, just like last time on a night like this when someone plunged to the ground. Here, the eye and ear of the information worker is, attend, uh, is attuned to the screw. How often have you considered the tiny, almost imperceptible screws at the bottom of your phone? Like the flat and shiny screen or the blank sheet of paper, it probably, was not, it probably is not very frequently uh, that you notice these things unless you break your screen and need it replaced. Information technology, screen and paper alike, normally receding from view behind the information meant to be conveyed. But for Leisure, the screw is a point of identification for the information worker. It may be that the focus of his or her labor on the assembly line, installing one or a small handful of tiny screws over and over again. The worker's ear is capable of picking up the light clink of the screw's fall. The act of noticing the screw is special since the poet says it won't attract attention, yet it has registering either in the poet's ear, the information laborer's ear, or both. And it has attracted our attention through this poem, a work of literature translated into English that attempts to make audible and visible the screw, offering an account of the legibility of material textuality from the non-reader's position. You tweet this talk, you call your partner, the phone depends on the screws. They are part of the material text before you as you read the Twitter stream or your email. But the screw is not legible to you. 
and neither is the body of the Foxconn worker whose fingerprints were wiped off with N-hexane before it was shipped, or as the body plummets in the night like the screw to the floor. Literature of material textuality from Melville to Leisure tries to reverse these processes of unseeing or not seeing, the processes of hiding that are both necessary for everyday reading and also politically troubling. Tartarus of Maids in 1855 and A Screw Fell to the Ground in 2014 both tried to make paper and screws legible for readers in new ways. These moments reconstitute the public sphere of reading into an expanded sensorium of material texts, a point I'll return to at the very end. So I now move from shoe leisure in the 21st century to Primus Fowl in the 18th, an enslaved person, I'm sorry, I lost my, uh, an enslaved person of African descent who was enslaved by Daniel Fowl a Boston and then New Hampshire printer. I make this move not only through a commitment to the continuities between print and digital culture, but also because in my work I'm trying to think about the, these material legibilities, forms of communication, uh, and the literary that are non-alphabetic. The piece of unshredded rag and rag paper, the accidental handprint watermark, the loose screw, a mark from a piece of broken type. What narratives might be here? Whose stories will we find and whose presence can we feel? After its founding in 1756, the New Hampshire Gazette was printed by an enslaved man, Primus Fowl. The initial page of the Gazette's first issue features a prospectus from the printer to the public. The printer writes, I now publish the first weekly Gazette for the province of New Hampshire as this is just the beginning of printing in this province. The printer who speaks, however, is not the same person as the printer who prints. The back page of each gazette states that the paper was printed by Daniel Fowl. But as we know from Isaiah Thomas, first historian of American print, Primus Fowl ran Daniel Fowl's presses, and during their first eight years in New Hampshire, he likely did so by himself until the earliest of Daniel Fowle's white apprentices arrived. Daniel Fowle was the owner of the press. He was also the owner of Primus Fowle. As such, Daniel Fowle is the printer of the Gazette. Some accounts go so far as to erase Primus Fowle from the room entirely, like Lawrence C. Roth's Colonial Printer, in which Roth writes that, quote, save for an interval of 10 years in which Daniel Fowle was assisted by his nephew, he continued his press alone until his death in 1787. Roth's erasure of Primus Fowl is in keeping with the pattern of non-acknowledgement through which laborers, especially the enslaved, are left off the record. On the other hand, uh, Primus Fowl is prolific. He worked for 50 years as a printer creating thousands of copies of newspapers, books, broadsides, and other materials that we can still hold and study in archives. This is especially true during the eight years of the Gazette's existence when it was essentially a two-man operation with Daniel Fowle composing type and Primus Fowle running the press. Primus Fowle's work is, in a way, voluminous and materially present to us, yet the person himself remains rather obscure. One way around this problem is to pay attention to the very materiality of the print that he produced, temporarily suspending initial desires to read the semantic information it conveys. Primus Fowl was a prolific creator of material texts. I'm sorry, if Primus Fowl was a prolific creator of material texts, which he was, then it is precisely in the most material aspects of his productions that I argue that he'll become visible. And before I get there, I just want to describe this rather remarkable uh, artifact. This is the back page of a broadside uh, that's held in the Rauner Special Collections Library at Dartmouth College. They have a lot of the foul shop print being an early New Hampshire library. Um, this is what we would normally see on the back page of anything printed from this shop, Portsmouth printed by D. Fowl, Daniel Fowl. And this one archival example, this one artifact, someone has come in, uh, someone contemporaneously, I think, based on the script, has, has come in in pen, in, uh, in a manuscript hand, and written 
Portsmouth printed by Daniel Fowell and then in manuscript, and Prime Fowell, a man of handsome color, 1760. Um, and so there's a way in which this manuscript edition is doing some of the work of unhiding um, that, I want, that I want to describe, but it's just such a remarkable artifact that I can't resist showing it and talking about it all the time. It's also, as I'll talk about a little bit, the artifact through which the digital information infrastructure of this library was able to add Primus Fowl um, as an author, creator, or other subject you know, within the sort of digital recording of this object. So one thing we know about Primus Fowl, the historical person uh, from contemporaneous accounts, is that he was disfigured by the act of pulling impressions on the hand press. The four very brief 18th and 19th century written sources documenting Primus Fowl's life suggest that pulling the handle on the hand press left him permanently bent forward at a 45 degree angle. Uh, Charles Brewster in his 1859 Rambles in Portsmouth recounts that, quote, through long service in bending over the press, he was bent to an angle of about 45 degrees. Primus Fowl becoming permanently bent at the waist as, as a result of repetitive pulling of impressions is consistent with the widespread phenomenon called printer's arm, uh, the strengthening of muscles on only one side of the body or the spine from repetitive motion. Um, and it is and also consistent with an account of Primus Fowl's, uh, an account of Primus Fowl immediately following his death in 1791. In a verse epigraph published in the Gazette, his news, the, the newspaper he produced, uh, this is days, weeks after his death, in May 19th, 19, uh, 1791, we read that, quote, Primus, a Negro late the property of Daniel Fowl, is deceased. He was a hearty friend and did possess a grateful mind, though oft borne down with pain. The pressure that Primus Fowl applied on the press created marks both on his body in his body and on the sheets of paper that became the Gazette as he pulled. I would argue then that as an artifact, the Gazette indexes one half of a process that also produced Primus Fowl's body, quote, borne down with pain. For every impression of letter and image into a page of the Gazette, there was an equal impression made in Primus Fowl's body. An archive of newspapers and a painfully disfigured spine resulted from the same process, the same pull. The tendency to privilege the ideas expressed in writing on a printed page means we usually overlook the non-semantic marks of a material text, but those marks may be the best indices of Primus Fowl's forceful pulling. Primus Fowl did not write for the Gazette, but left his impression clear, but his impression left marks all over the newspaper and in places beyond the printing of white men's words. I propose reading what I'm calling Primus Fowl's impressive force on the page through its visible traces in the paper's margins and in its masthead. That impressive force is an index of him and his enslavement at the same time that it brings the Gazette into being both legible on the surface of the page. I'm gonna talk about this example now. The New Hampshire Gazette's original masthead featured a woodcut depicting the fable of the fox and the crow, which was restruck from an abridgment of Croxall's Aesop. It was part of the masthead for the first 43 issues between October 7, 1756 and July 29, 1757. At first, in the earlier the earlier one is down here. We go from, we go uh, through time vertically uh, in this image. Let's see. Mm -hmm. At first, the cut depicts the scene of the fox on the ground flattering the crow in a tree, and it is entirely surrounded by a solid border. By issue 14, this is the one in the middle, January 7, 1757, Pieces of the once solid border begin to break off. Pieces of the woodcut continue to break off through the first half of 1757 until late July when the tree, the crow, and the framing line break away completely. The August 5th, 1757 masthead is then reconfigured without a woodcut illustration. Later that year, October 8th, 1757, a woodcut engraving depicting a different fable takes the place of the original. 
What might heightened sensitivity to the signifying potential of the material text tell us about this occurrence? Isaiah Thomas reports the cut's breakage in, in his History of American Printing, but attributes no meaning to it. This is Isaiah Thomas writing in the first decade, uh, the second decade of uh, the 19th century. The cut was, in a short time, broken by some accident. Um, I should also mention Isaiah Thomas is the founder of the American Antiquarian Society, which gives him a certain kind of presence uh, in the field and in these questions of the archive. So Thomas says, the cut was, in a short time, broken by some accident. But that accident is precisely where we might say Primus Fowl was here. The breakage is either directly resultant from or quickly worsened by the force of Primus Fowl's pull. An accident can also be that which is present, but not, nece but not necessarily so. A material remainder beyond what is considered the essence of a thing. We might think of how the term accident is used in um, Christian or Catholic, uh, Catholic accounts of transubstantiation, right? The bread and the wine are the material accidents. Um, primus fowl is likewise present, but not necessarily so, accidental to the production of the Gazette's information. But accidents are also historical contingencies. And like primus fowl's pulling of the press, happen in a particular place and time and create a particular material record. So I would advocate for a reading of the richness of such accidents. The thin line or wood or uh, the thin line of wood at the point where the breakage begins is structurally the weakest part of this cut. At that part of the cut, there is no supporting material stabilizing the piece that prints the line. As we can see slowly over time, uh, over the course of the first year of the Gazette, pieces break away from the down and outward force of the platen. The breakage can be attributed to the force of Primus Fowl's press work and is a place in the material text where we can tangibly locate his presence in the production of the Gazette without necessarily being distracted by a call to read writing, although here we can read visually, which is an issue that I've been thinking a lot about lately. Here is the excessive force of Primus Fowl's press work pushing down to create the image, but also flowing outward and breaking the cut. Refusing to regard the results of Primus Fowl's presence as insignificant inky accidents, we engage in what um, African-Americanist uh, Lois Brown has called in a related context, the, the purposeful reclamation of the ordinary in African-Americanist recovery work. Ordinary sources, those that might escape notice when one is looking for more traditional evidence, quote, this is Brown, give voice to the subtle accidental connections that can help bring submerged African-American histories to light. At this early moment in the Gazette's publication history, Primus Fowl was pulling the press and slowly over time breaking the masthead engraving. We have no reason to believe he did it purposefully, and I don't think it matters uh, if he meant to do it or not. We need not have intentionally broke, he need not have intentionally broken the engraving in order to inscribe a message or to leave some subtle sign of subversion of Daniel Fowl. The breakage is simply a visible record of the fact that Primus Fowl applied force to a press and made the inky impression that we can read and touch in the Gazette. Primus Fowl left no record of his voice or words, but he did leave everyday ordinary marks all over the print he produced, marks that were not intended to be put there by a writer or editor. Accidental or not, they are Primus Fowl's marks created by him. Um, another scene of this print that I've been looking at is the sort of overprinting on the shoulders uh, of the type. So along almost every, um, along almost every um, bottom margin of the print that came out of this shop, especially in the first 10 years when Primus was pretty much the only one working in there, uh, we see a kind of overprinting on the shoulder of the type, which I'll describe in a second. <clears throat> Early issues of the Gazette make frequent use of, the, of its margins to include information that would not fit within the regular columnal, columnar frame, making it necessary to turn the paper and read in the margins. You know, there's like a late breaking news or an advertisement that comes in late, they just print it right there in the margin, and you kind of have to turn the page uh, often, often to read it. Even more frequently, throughout the first several years of the paper, there is readily, readily observable underlining effect at the bottom edge of the sheets. 
As Primus Fowl inked the type before making the impression, he deposited ink on the shoulder of the type, the part of the type body that is lower than the letter form, uh, the shoulder that is not type high, and therefore not meant to print. But as Primus Fowl pulled the lever on the press, he did so with enough force that the paper regularly curled over onto the type shoulder and made an impression at the bottom of each page. The effect is not uncommon within the pages of the Gazette and is observable in nearly every issue of the paper's first year and other broadsides when Primus Fowl was operating the, uh, the press. So I've thought a lot about how to read uh, these marks in the margin, and I'm still trying to develop you know, what exactly the, the, the reading here is. I think there's one way in which you can like, make a case for like literally reading in the margins, right, for people who are marginalized, um, and therefore taking this as a symbolic margin. And um, I'm not quite sure that that's the direction that I want to go, but I do want to note that this is another sort of textual accident uh, where primus foul is visible. Um, and I don't want to rush my reading just to say, oh, well, this isn't this interesting? Like, there's primus foul in the margins. Yes, it is. Um, but I think it's a little, a little too neat. And this is, by definition, like messy work. Right? This is the mess in the type, and I want to give it space uh, before I sort of arrive at a definitive reading of what's going on here. But um, I do want to say that once Primus Fowl and his marks become visible to us, I think a new kind of reading is possible. These marks and traces become the very sites from which we can critique the common sensibility, or the, the literal common sense, that writes primus foul out of legibility, and these marks out of legibility. Something that is seen but not given an account. In other words, the marginal printing and other non-alphabetic ma uh, material text gives us a way of making visible what lies outside the common political and aesthetic frames of both 18th century print culture and our contemporary encounters with it in the archive. Primus Fowl and his labor typically lay outside what Jacques Rossier calls the distribution of the sensible, outside the politically constructed common sense of, quote, what is seen and what can be said about it. This dullness of our senses to the materiality of texts is precisely why Shu Lejeur can see and hear the screw, and we might not. Why Herman Melville can sense the presence of hands inside paper, and we usually would not. The Rossierian notion is useful because it provokes us to explore the political lines of inclusion and exclusion, determining what is legible to whom in the aesthetic objects we encounter. In terms of 18th century print culture in the Gazette, the force of Primus Fowl's impressions creates the alphabetic and representational information that we, prior that we prioritize. At the same time, it creates excesses that uh, like Primus Fowl himself, are not meant to be seen. We know that without decades of Primus Fowl's energy and craft pressed into his own musculature and the newspaper coevally, the, that the Gazette would not have existed in the way it does. But we typically do not have ways to read for Primus Fowl, and if we insist on basing scholarly claims only on positive traces of him in people like him, such as mentions in print or records of his work and life, then we are forced to ignore what we do know that he produced, literally thousands of pages of material text. This then is a call to change our very sense of print and reaching back to the beginning of this talk, our very sense of the digital. I'd like with this work to provoke a reallocation of our distribution of what is sensible moving the line between legible and illegible far enough that Primus Fowl's marks are seeable as evidence of his work, his craft, and his presence within the archive of an otherwise all-white newspaper. And for the best example of this kind of recalibrating senses outside the restrictive frame of publishing, authorship, and reading in the public sphere, um, one great example of this work is Elizabeth Maddock Dillon's new book, New World Drama, where she develops the idea of a performative commons in which she says illiterate subjects like Fowl materialize and become visible and legible on their own terms rather than through the technologies of social death. It may ultimately be impossible to put names to publications 
and names to devices in all cases, but the interdisciplinary work of book history, digital humanities, material culture studies, has shown that sometimes we can comprehend print and digital laborers through the material texts they created and the records surrounding them. In general, this work has not been done for enslaved printers, compositors, engravers, paper makers, and so on. And as we, may, as we move further into an age of devices made from silicon, glass, and rare earth metals, we have the opportunity to not repeat these silences. <clears throat> Their hands and minds produce the print and devices and information that artists touch and interpret. In the memorial epigraph on the death of Primus, published in the weeks after his death, we read that under these clods, old Primus lies at rest and free from noise, no longer seen by mortal eyes. Primus Fowell's remains are likely still buried under Chestnut and Court Street in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, but we have thousands of pages of his work and need not bury it any longer. Thank you, I'm happy to take questions. case of, of what I'm doing and I am incredibly fortunate to have what information I do have and then when this when this came to light uh, the, the prime follow man of handsome color it was just amazing it's like oh someone contemporaneously to him like made the argument that I'm making and, and that I would like to also make about the relationship between the printer and, and Prime's foul. And so yeah, this is, this is really at the heart of the methodological question that I think this project is um, troubled by, but, but also sort of looking forward to working through. Um, I, <clears throat> I think about this a little bit in the first book about rag paper. Um, and to go back to that example, fairly when the handkerchief is no longer fit to cover your snowy breast, uh, yeah, send it to Parsons Paper Mill and it will turn to you in the form of a lover's No, it's a, it's a fantasy. But it's a fantasy that has enough basis in, in uh, reality that it's sort of using, it's, it's sort of using the literary to animate uh, the material world in a certain way that is possible but unlikely. So it's a kind of speculative account of uh, the print public sphere. One that is rather, instead of being about uh, strangers and about being um, disembodied is entirely embodied and is intimate. And so I think about that as related to this kind of sense of the material text that I'm calling for here, um, because some of it may need to be speculative, um, to be aware of the possibilities of print produced in 18th century Caribbean. Um, for example, or pretty much 18th century everywhere mm -hmm. uh, in North America. And so I don't, I don't have a complete answer for that question other than that I would like it, I would like to address subjects that we both have 
that we have positive knowledge about, uh, but also that we don't. Um, and I think that my the f the foot of my work that remains in literary studies would sort of come back to the ten the, the tendency of people in this in this very period to use um, poetry, fiction, the, the form of the narrative. Uh, to give voice to these fantasies of textuality, or to give an account of the unlikely but the possible. If that makes sense. Yeah. But yeah, I'm definitely like, if you have answers from material culture studies about this problem, I would love to hear too. <laughs> yes. I just wanted to ask actually a question following up on what Deborah was just asking. Um, this is a really fascinating paper. I, um, I thank you for presenting it. But the way I want to sort of phrase the question is, I think this, um, is, it seems to me that there's a bit of a slippage in what you're presenting between whether you're attempting to recover the agency of an unwritten community or class or group and the agency of a lost historical individual. Mm -hmm. And I think any of us who are engaged in the act of writing and recognize that the things we write will persist beyond us feel that there are a lot of things that we produce that we hope don't persist, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That, you know, I, I, I personally hope that all my notes are burnt yeah. when I'm gone. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so the question then is if you take all of those accidents, those things that many of us wouldn't want to survive, and use that to reproduce a historical subject, is that historical subject that you're reproducing not in some ways or potentially reproducing some of the systems of oppression that you're trying to emancipate them from? Well, I, I mean, I don't know. This, this is part of the problem that I want to provoke in my own field, like you know, early American book history or early American studies, because I, I, I kind of want more people to understand much of the archive of print as ensnared in those systems of, of oppression. Right, like what, what possibly could a white author newspaper in New Hampshire have to do with history of slavery? Well, it turns out everything, right? Um, but we often don't think about our archives of print as you know, developed out of and as actual material returns, as valuable material returns on enslaved labor. Um, so I think I, you know, I kind of want to preserve that um, that's structure. I don't know. That's not right. I don't want to preserve the structure of oppression. I want to make it visible where, uh, at first, it isn't. Not to say that everything that is written uh, in 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 the New Hampshire Gazette or in other texts that are produced through compelled enslaved labor uh, are, are somehow corrupt and not worth looking at. But rather to think about the hard the, the hard work of thinking about the entanglements uh, with enslavement and with the revenants of enslaved people within within these texts. Um, that being said, I, I would follow the work of some of my colleagues like um, Tara Bynum, who's at Hampshire College, who does a lot of work on Phyllis Wheatley, uh, who's writing a book on how we shouldn't necessarily understand Phyllis Wheatley's life as only a struggle, uh, only and always a struggle with, um, with slavery and, and trying to subvert enslavement. It was, um, you know, clearly she lived a lot of her life enslaved, uh, and clearly that matters for her. But um, Bynum writes about Phyllis Wheatley's friendships um, and her letters between friends, um, and to think about like friendship as a register in which we can think about enslaved life or life while enslaved. Um, so I wouldn't want. I also wouldn't want to look at this and say. Primus Fowl's life was a life of misery and misery alone, uh, and, and that you know we can only encounter him through this kind of everyday drudgery of running the press. Um, although I do think it's meaningful that that press work um, reconfigured his body and caused him pain. I wouldn't want that to eclipse or to become you know, all we know Primus Fowl through at the same time. How might we re think about reclaiming digital workers, mm -hmm. people who are building hardware, working with the screws and the screens? Is it is it necessary for us to know, or is this 
something we I'm thinking about like tags and clothes that say inspected by mm -hmm. it's like a little remnant of somebody who actually touched the mm -hmm. clothing we end up wearing but I'm thinking like my phone it doesn't have that mm -hmm. um, uh, um, I just wonder if you thought about that how we these artifacts lead back to a person um, but it would Feel like it would be much harder mm -hmm. to do that with mm -hmm. our digital uh, materials. Yeah, I've thought about this in, t in at least two ways. Um, one, again, is to think about the work that literature does. So the Melville example is like a magazine story that sought to make the conditions of the production of the magazine like, actually legible and visible to the people who purchased Harper's in 1856. Um, but there are other ways that uh, aesthetics writing um, provoke these forms of identification and sort of troubling politics. Uh, in the first, I can't think about it, maybe around 2009, if you go back to um, technology magazines, online technology magazines, there's this thing called iPhone Girl. Uh, do you still remember iPhone Girl? No. Uh, so it was another view into, into the Foxconn factory. It, Shuli Jure's view in is through poetry. Um, iPhone Girl was this instance where, uh, apparently in the production of an iPhone, at the end of the production line, um, the workers are supposed to test the camera to make sure it works by taking a photo and then deleting it. Um, so iPhone Girl hmm. is a photo that was not deleted. It was a young woman who worked at the Foxconn factory uh, and someone bought, you know, went out and got an iPhone, opened up their pictures, and there she was. Uh, and it was a first look into these factories, which are incredibly secretive because of trade secrets and all of that. Uh, but it also, it also had um, you know, a, a photogenic young woman's face, and people then wanted to know her story. Um, and the use of sentiment can be really important in the, 18th, in the 19th century as well as now. So from the iPhone girl moment, um, a storyteller named Mike Daisy started doing a bunch of uh, research into Apple products and Shenzhen, uh, traveled to Shenzhen, came back and did a one-man uh, show in Chicago called Mike Daisy and the Apple Factory, in which he tells a story of going to Shenzhen and meeting workers and talking to them about the conditions there, uh, and talking about his own you know, sort of guilty relationship to his devices, and, and um, he tells a story of a young girl who, be, who is, um, you know, too young to work, but is still working, and she becomes injured and disfigured by her work in the Foxconn factory. Um, and it's very much like a 19th century male girl story that was used to, you know, provoke any number of reforms uh, in 19th century industrial mill towns and things like that. Daisy's story got picked up by This American Life in late 2011 and it was an entire episode of This American Life was his one man show Mike Daisy and the Apple Factory in which he tells this story um, and the, f the fallout in the next week is pretty incredible um, all of a sudden people start asking these questions what is my ethical responsibility to um, as a consumer of this and are people getting injured and I haven't thought about these people uh, about a couple months later, uh, somebody uh, called Ira Glass, I guess, or somebody at um, This American Life or WBEZ in Chicago and said, wait a second, I knew this guy, parts of the story are made up. Um, this isn't all true. It, in, the, in the intervening months, the New York Times launched an investigation of Shenzhen. It provoked Apple to do a self-study. Of the, of the contractors that they used, and they did find a number of the labor abusive labor practices and illegal labor practices that Daisy had talked about. Um, but somebody, somebody calls and says, wait, this guy's making some things up. Not everything happened. The people he described aren't real. One of the things that Daisy does is take like, events that happen to different people and combines them into the figure of the young girl because he may or may not know, like since the middle of the 19th century, like the sentimental figure of the young girl embroiled in the industrial scene, uh, either in Melville or um, in novels like The Silent Partner by Elizabeth Stuart Phelps, moves people politically. Uh, so really nothing that Daisy, no condition that Daisy described was really false, um, but the figure that he creates in the sentimental narrative was. And 
to this provoked this American life to um, have this entire episode retracting the story. The story is called Retraction, and they spend an entire hour going detail by detail through all of Daisy's uh, all of Daisy's story, and completely distancing themselves from themselves from the story. You can't actually listen to the original story, Mike Daisy and the Apple Factory, on this American Life's archive anymore. You have to go to a web archive where people have um, preserved it. They don't. Iroblast don't have anything to do. Uh, with the story after that. So I think there's an interesting lesson there about like the work of uh, narrative, the work of literature, film, representation, you know, all the way from the power of the visual of seeing iPhone Girl to um, the way in which a story provokes uh, political movement. Um, so you know, it did, it did force Apple to own up to some willful uh, ignorance about what their contractors were up to, and it did apparently provoke changes in what was going on in the factory, but it also provoked a kind of crisis of, um, uh, of, of, of truth and representation in uh, this American life, which is fascinating. A friend of mine uh, named Mike Dwyer who teaches at Arcadia University. Uh, we were talking about this, 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 this American life crisis, and we said, like, do you really think that their fact checkers uh, really verified that David Sedaris actually had uh, marijuana floating in his urine sample when he went to work as an elf for Macy's. It's a famous part of, of uh, David Sedaris' story of uh, working in Santa Land was that you know, he can't believe that he was hired after failing a drug test. He says there were roaches floating in my urine. Um, so why in that story can this American life run it uh, for a certain effect and why in another do they have to distance themselves? I mean, the answer is global capital, but um, it's interesting nonetheless. The second thing, very long answer to a, a great and simple question. The second thing is, I think, noting the infrastructural turn in a number of scholarly fields. So instead of focusing on individual expressions in the way that I just was, thinking about, uh, I think more people in a number of fields are rather thinking about like, the infrastructures that make communication possible rather than individual communication. Um, and that, that seems significant as we begin to think about digital devices in, in particular to make, um, early on I, I talked a little bit about like the project of poetics and a kind of formalist criticism that wants to you know, study the systems of meaning making of, uh, and, and, and rather than you know, historicizing individual texts. I think infrastructural studies um, are an interesting and I think in some ways better version of a kind of formalist approach, um, not to, to literature, but to the, the sort of technological field and social field of communication making and meaning making. I'm sorry, someone else didn't have a chance. Yeah. I, don't, I, I mean, I thought it was a great presentation. I don't want to take more people's time. But I want to ask a contrarian type of question, because looking, for instance, at that slide there, you know, I wonder for myself whether something like that leads me in my scholarship to a kind of nostalgia. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering how you deal with that, the threat to science, to research, from a kind of sentiment, sentimentalization, of the, possible sentimentalization of the past, because in a way, does the handprint change the words that he composited or not? And if not, do, do we then have a kind of uh, bifurcation between sort of the life of an object and the sentimental reconstruction and what, what's actually said in the newspaper? So I think I wouldn't ultimately argue for an either or on this. In this particular project and the work that I presented today, I'm very purposefully focusing on moving away from the alphabetic. In part because it's sort of it was a thought experiment for me to not pay attention to what is written in the newspaper to see what else becomes visible. Uh, I think beyond, beyond that experiment, there's a lot to be said about the relationship between one and the other. So um, a great example of this <clears throat> and I have to thank Tom Keimer at University of Toronto for bringing this to my attention, is the figure of Aesop, right, who himself is a slave, 
who has to use um, figural language storytelling fables in order to speak. And what is the what are the what are the layers of meaning between Primus Fowl's printing that um, Primus Fowl's effect on the cut and also the story of the fox and the crow or the, the figure of Aesop. So I don't know that I would I don't know that I would separate them for one ultimately even though I did here. I think that uh, there's important work to be done that will think those two moments together. Um, I also don't know that it always leads to sentiment. I think that writing about this Writing about these people is often sentimental, or using the history of sentiment in order to jar readers out of the habit of not seeing. But I don't know that it's the only account for this. Um, and so I, you know, I don't know that the work of recreating labor is necessarily nostalgic or sentimental, or maybe not even recreating, or uh, being attuned to, or conscious of, or trying to think about ways to read uh, la the history of labor or craft within an object. Um, I don't see why necessarily it would have to be sentimental or nostalgic. And maybe you'd like to push back on that, and I'd be happy to hear. Uh, we have time for one more. Deborah, did you? Well, I just, this is more, I, I don't want to provoke, I mean, we don't have time for a whole longer discussion of this, but, I just, you started um, in the beginning, you were talking about surface, and uh, it's just my observation that what you're doing here is anything but on the surface. Mm -hmm. I think it starts with the surface, and your, your image of the, you know, the micros microscopic view of the rag paper, but um, kind of infrastructure is not surface. Mm -hmm. And so I just, you know, maybe in a, lo a longer form that's worked out mm -hmm. more, but, um, you know, it's not, it's not, I mean, I think it is more contextual analysis of sort of material culture mm -hmm. studies, the way, you know, you do a, a painting and you find the, tr the artist's hand or something mm -hmm. in the painting and you want to understand the techniques and, and all of that. But um, it, it, it rapidly goes way beyond the surface. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree completely. I think in, in the ways that I'm, in the ways that I try to think about these objects, what at first appears as surface actually becomes like a nexus or a door uh, that immediately implies depth and systems uh, rather than a, a simple um, a two-dimensional you know, figure, exactly. I'm pushing back a little bit against this current tendency in, in literary studies to move away from depth, move away um, and to think about just what is they say manifestly there, and I think what is actually manifestly there is always a play between what appears to be a surface and what is actually producing that thing, which is its infrastructure, its long history. Um, and I also think you need to go back to another way of accounting for these materials. Um, I think there's a lot of ways that we've come to talk about texts that can be usefully reframed um, if we start thinking about other moments in their life beyond their alphabetic content. Like one of the things that one of the things that actually really bugs me is the way that we date text. So we say this book is from 1765. That's the moment when it was imprinted, right? Like there are many other ways of of counting or accounting this material object, um, but we've privileged print to the point where we just don't think about like, well, actually, when is this paper produced? Where is it from? I, this great example that I use in my teaching is a. Uh, title, uh, a title page for an 18th century text on a light table, and you can see, right, it says like printed in 1750 or whatever, but the watermark inside is like 1745, right? So it immediately produces this conversation in the material object itself that until we start thinking about what other labors are here, um, don't usually rise to visibility. Um, so I'd say exactly, like we might, we start with surface, it's manifest, but it immediately invites us into itself and into a larger. And also system. out in the other direction in terms of perception and, you know, a book is not, many books are printed more than once. Mm -hmm. You know, there are many printings that go through a long period of time and editions and translations and all kinds of other ways that that that, that moment is, it shouldn't be privileged mm -hmm. of, of the imprint. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you so no, much. Thank you for coming and thank you for your questions.